just is so incredible and very surreal. What a trip down memory lane for uh, those of us who, who grew up coming to Disneyland and, and seeing the show. And uh, just imagine, like, what, when those drums started playing, all the people outside, you know, I hope they were just all going, oh my gosh, <laughs> it's back, you know. I just hope that Disneyland is, like, swarmed with requests for the Teaching Terrace after tonight. So. Um, <laughs> Before, before we talk to Rolly here, I, I want to say when I, when I was a Jungle Cruise skipper back in the 80s, um, you know, the show would begin in the evenings, all during the day. People would be coming up to the little front desk here and making their reservation for a dinner. And then when the show would open, uh, they, uh, you know, the place would fill up. So in the evenings, we'd have that wonderful smell of food and, uh, and the drums would be going. And this little area right back here was open so that the audience couldn't really see the Jungle Cruise boats going by all the time. That would be distracting. But we could see the stage as we were coming out of the jungle. You could look back, and the drums would be going. It was kind of loud. It would sort of block out whatever the skipper was trying to say, because you had this show you were competing with. And so your whole boat load would just turn to look and see all the, the performers going and everything. It was so exciting. It was such a part of the, the texture of, of Disneyland that uh, that we miss. But Roy, I was going to ask you, how are you by the way? How was your dinner? <laughs> that food was amazing too. Um, what was what's your what was the first time that you saw the Tahitian Terrace or remember the Tahitian Terrace? Well, what yeah, I was working in the bazaar at the time, and I heard the drums going, and I knew they were building the Tahitian Terrace. And so I came out, and I looked down, and there were these gorgeous little girls with their school skirts going, and I thought to myself, Jesus Christ, we can't put that in Disneyland. <laughs> How are we going to get away with that? And we all started talking about it. And uh, we were wondering what Walt thought of it. Well, what happened was one of the guys in, uh, in, in the uh, Department uh, of Entertainment finally asked Walt, he says, Walt, don't you think that shows a bit much? And Walt said, no, you have to understand, we have to have something for the dads. <laughs> and Walt was a dad. Yeah. <laughs> you know, is it funny? I, I, I always think of that Disneyland After Dark show where you see the hula girls are going, and there's that one guy in the audience who kind of adjusts his glasses. <laughs> They're like all steamed up. You know? <laughs> I love that. Well, um, now Tahitian Terrace opened before Tiki Room, correct? Yes. Like but around the same time, but a little bit before that. Pretty much the same time. And when uh, you were working on the Tiki Room, did you? Uh, what type of research did you do as far as, um, I mean, I know about some of the books, and I brought a few of the books that you looked at uh, in creating some of the Tiki Gods and whatnot, but did you go to uh, some of the Los Angeles area restaurants or uh, like Don the Beachcombers or Trader Vic's or any of those kinds of places? No, I was aware of them. But you didn't know. <laughs> well, I brought a couple of the books that I thought maybe you guys would like to see. Voices on the Wind by Catherine Luamala and uh, the Oceanic Art Book that I know Mark Davis used quite a lot in uh, the Tiki Room. But of course, he had his own, his own notes and his own records. But uh, when we, uh, long ago, years ago, Jody and I were at the library there at, at uh, WED, and um, they had this book, I know, with the little library card still in it with your name on it and, uh, and Mark Davis's, and we wanted to steal that card really bad. <laughs> we did not steal that card. But someone else, I think, has, so yeah, it's gone now. Uh, but anyway, Voices on the Wind, I think, was a, a, a really influential book to you. Yeah. What happened was uh, we had quite a few meetings with Walt while we were doing the TV room, and uh, finally it was starting to develop as a show. And at that time, of course, it was a restaurant. It wasn't designed to be a show. It was a show within the restaurant. So Walt felt that there, when people were standing in line to have a meal that they should be entertained, so he asked me to come up with some ideas of some cheekies out front that would talk. So I went to John Hinch, I said, what the hell will I do? And he says, go to the UCLA library and see if you can't get a book on cheekies. So the one that she's talking about here was written by the missionaries 
And in there, she lists all the different beliefs of the, uh, the, the gods and the jinkies that they uh, believe that all Yamajas believed in. So all the little sketches that I did were developed uh, from those ideas. And so the, the little the jinkies that you see there really are takeoffs on the real beliefs. Uh, it was great. It was, it was, some of the stuff was really fun. So we had a great time doing that. And I presented uh, those sketches to Walt, and there was one that wasn't a tiki god, it was one that I kind of made up about fitting water into a bamboo and it fills and it dumps and it, what it does is when it dumps it, it makes a sound and it scares the rabbits and the deer away. Well, that's something I read about in Japan, and so I did a little sketch of that guy, you know, spitting water in there. But I didn't have a name for him. And so what happened was, um, Walt's asking me, are all these true tikis and true stories? I said, oh yes, they are. And so he says, what's this the god of? And he pointed to that particular one. And I just went blank. Well, luckily, Hench was pretty quick. And he says, that's the god of Tampa Clock beating. And uh, Walt misunderstood him. When he heard Tampa Clock, he thought he said, clock. And so he said to John, he says, Clock? And John said, yeah, it's a guy that tells the time. <laughs> what happened was, after the meeting was over, John says, you better go find the goddamn guy that tells the time. <laughs> <laughs> and it was uh, Maui. And so, we, you know, uh, these are what we call happy accidents. With, uh, <laughs> and uh, explain the uh, explain the sun and, the, uh, and the, the ropes that are tying the sun to Maui. Okay, well, that's part of being uh, the god that tells the time. What happened was, before uh, Maui took over, the uh, sun would set whenever it wanted to. It set two in the afternoon, it set five in the afternoon, and there would be all the natives up picking coconuts off the tree, or they'd be out fishing, and it would go dark. And so they went to Maui, and they said, Maui, we've got to do something about this. We have no control over the sun. And so, supposedly, Maui threw seven ropes over the sun, and if the sun didn't set when it was supposed to, Maui would jerk him back. Well, supposedly, if you look at in the afternoon, if you look towards the sun, there's actually seven rays. And those seven rays represent the seven ropes that uh, Maui used to jerk the sun back with. So, we, I did this little sculpture of a little sun, and I put seven ropes on him, and then I attached it to to Maui's head. <laughs> See, again, we made it up as we went. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's all based on truth, which makes it, um, you know, all, all the better. And you know, a lot of a lot of young artists who are now kind of creating tiki's. There's a lot of tiki artists these days, and I notice a lot of them aren't really going back to the original uh, stories, the original. Uh, you know, Polynesian mythology. They're they're really just looking at your stuff, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and and you are you are as deep as, as they go. So in their research, but you know, one thing that really struck me about this book is that first of all, it's really fascinating. I uh, I've had this for a, a while, and there's there's very few pictures. You all would be surprised if you go home right now and like order it on Amazon. You'll be like, wow, oh, where's all those photos? Well, all those drawings and. Well, there's a few little illustrations, but really, it's the stories, and that I think is says a whole lot about about you and about uh, uh, about what you were able to, to conjure up. Yeah. Well, you know, it's kind of interesting because Walt bought off on all of the sketches. They were just little ink drawings. So I went to Blaine Gibson, who was our head sculptor, and he was the only sculptor we had. And I said to Blaine, I said, Walt bought off on these. You got to sculpt them. And he says, I don't have time to sculpt them. And I said, well, we've got to get them sculpted. And, and, I, and he said, well, we're going to get them sculpted, but I'm not going to do it. And I said, who's going to do it? He says, you are. And I said, I've never sculpted before in my life. And he said, well, you're going to sculpt now. So he taught me how to build the armature. And it was really, it was the springtime, and it was really cold inside the old wed where we were working. And we used plastiline clay to, to, to do the sculpting on it. And, and when it's cold, you can't get it to move. You can't even get it onto the armature. So I put uh, my armature on a set of wheels and I went out into the parking lot where it was warm. So I went out there and now he was sculpted in the parking lot. Now, and a lot of the other ones that we did were sculpted out there too because it was the only warm place where we could work. 
So again, you know, people think, oh my God, we'll stop. We probably have a, a north light. We must have a beautiful window. This is before Nike came up with it. We just did it. We don't. We have a clue what we were doing. Rolly, is it true that you sculpted the tiki gods with a plastic fork? Yes. Yes, yes. I did. Yeah, I got them from the commissary. <laughs> plastic fork. And uh, Lane was nice enough to explain to me to kind of make it look like it's kind of a, a palm tree or whatever. So anyway, it was the fork that did the job. And uh, it was great. You can get, I mean, wouldn't have so damn much fun. It was scary. <laughs> Oh, that's amazing. Wow. Well, um, you know, absolutely. <laughs> this, this, this is a collector's item. <laughs> when we were, when I was doing the, uh, we were getting ready to open up the, 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 the bazaar, and it was going to open about 7 o'clock at night, and it was around noon time, and we were all set, and two little ladies came into the bazaar with boxes, and there was rubber lizards in them, and there was hats in them and everything. And they brought him in and they said, can we put him here? And I said, yes, feel free. And I said, are you selling these tonight out of the bazaar? And they said, no, we're going to sell them out of the little shop out there. And I looked out there, there was no shop. And I said, what shop? And she said, don't worry, there'll be a shop there. And I thought, so this was at noon. So about 3 o'clock, nothing had shown up. And I thought, are they going to bring a big truck out of here and put the shop there or what? And uh, no, no, I kept waiting and waiting. There was a stub up for electrical outlet. And then around 3.30, three or four trucks showed up. And there was a drapery shop truck. There was carpenters. There was electricians. And it was almost like time-lapse photography building this little shop. And believe it or not, in three and a half hours, that shop was finished and it was up. And it was open that night. And the next day, I went to the shop. And I bought this hat. And I want you to know I've kept this hat now for 50 years. Yeah. I'm very, very, very proud of it. So this, this is a collector's item. I think I still have a rubber snake from that shop. What? A rubber snake. I think I got a rubber snake there, a rubber lizard or something. My brother and I, I always love the smell of those rubber snakes. They have kind of that tire smell. <laughs> you know, the thing that's beautiful about that shop, it was there for 30 years. And that just shows you how busy land maintenance takes care of everything. So I'm really proud of that. Of course, over the years, they've got more money and they build a new one. Anyway, it's a great time. Yeah. Uh, I love that, that you always, um, you know, you've often said that you like to use, uh, you like to be involved with your projects from beginning to end. You know? from the concepts up into uh, the designs and then right into the installation, which I think is really great. Well, I was fortunate in the, in the Cheeky room. Uh, after I sculpted the Cheekies, we sent them over to the studio and they made them out of fiberglass. And then they sent the fiberglass back to us and then I painted them. I painted them. And so then we shipped them to Disneyland and I actually went down and helped them install them at Disneyland. Well, of course, if you're trying to do that today, you're trying to go through 40 or 50 people, and God knows how much paperwork you have to be signed. In those days, you just did it. In fact, Disneyland would call and they said, you know, we really need some more shields on the wall so we can have some more coffee on them. So four of us came in on a Saturday and sculpted the shields and sent them on down. Management didn't even know it. It was all done by phone because we were a family. There was no paperwork done or anything. In fact, I think Dick Irvine didn't even know we did it. So it was, uh, it was kind of a, a beautiful time. Again, it was really family. I have to say something, too, about about Rolly's Tiki's. Um, you know, Jody and I uh, did a collectible set of uh, little figurines of all the Tiki's uh, over the years. and. It's funny, we, we were trying to find photographs of the back sides of them. And, uh, you know, people don't really take photos of the bats, they take photos of the front. And um, we came down here to Disneyland, and we were trying to, like, crane our necks behind Maui, between that wall, you know, trying to see, what does this butt look like? <laughs> and it was impossible, because everything is, like, you know, so set. And so we actually had a friend in Florida, and we called them and said, go get yourself some drinks at the Polynesian, and then walk around that pool area, because a lot of Rolly's tiki's are decorating the pool area at the Polynesian Resort in Florida. 
And so they had just trimmed their bushes back around, you know, the landscape is so our friends were climbing in the in the bushes, taking pictures of everyone's backside and then emailing them to us. So we had some reference. That's how we had to do this. And we were uh, we were surprised that a couple of your TVs had faces on their butts. <laughs> Like little happy, smiley people. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Well, you know, if you have the figurine set, you can see them very easily. And we did. We did recreate that. We didn't make those up. No. Uh, I, I, I love that. Well, um, tell us a little bit about some of your. Um, I'd love to hear about some of your uh, your, uh, your art inspirations and some of the artists that inspired you. And uh, well. <laughs> That's a long story. <laughs> um, basically, I, I came out of the loop for a couple of months, and in there we told the stories of how I learned. And actually, I trained myself because I didn't have any form of training at all. But I think the, uh, in my age, the thing that really helped me more than anything else was the radio. Because I came home from school and I listened to all the little serials that were on the radio, and they were 15 minute serials. Everything from Jack Armstrong, you know, the American boy, and God knows what. And um, so what that what the radio did was helped your imagination because you had to get pictures in your head of what you were listening to. So I think I, I was influenced by the radio a lot. And then magic became my hobby when I was nine years old. And I think there was a lot in magic that helped me with uh, some of the things that I thought about when I was deciding. You know, the, the magic, when you show a card trick, I thought, well, you've got to do something better than your card and you find it. And you've got to take it to the next level. So I started practicing doing card tricks and taking it to the next level. Well, I found out that as time went on, whenever I was working on a project, whether it was Disney or anywhere else, I always tried to take it to the next level. And that meant, you know, reaching out and doing something that hadn't been done before. I, know, I do know for a fact that when I did the fairy tales in that fairy farm, the one thing I tried to get them to do at Disneyland and they wouldn't do it was to mix black light and incandescent light. And uh, my beloved reader, Digger, went to, oh, no, it's all black light. You can't have incandescent light in there. Well, I had seen an exhibit with a uh, Dracula in a coffin, and in the coffin it was black light, which gave him a real weird look, but the rest of the coffin was met with incandescent light. So we did the fairy tales from that very far, from that very far. That's what we did. We used incandescent and we mixed it with black light. And I think it was a marvelous uh, effect that you get. And I think the one reason they kicked it off was when you went into a dark ride way back, you know, Peter Pan or so, way, way back when they were first open, they were only 90 seconds long when you went in there. And after you stood in line, your eyes were not adjusted to the, the dark room. So when you were in there, maybe <laughs> the first part of your 90 seconds, you didn't see a thing because your eyes didn't get accustomed to it. So when we did the fairy tales, the whole first section, I did with incandescent light because you were outside and seeing incandescent light it gave your eyes a chance to kind of adjust to the darkness. And then from there, we introduced the black light. So I think there's a, you have to do a lot of homework to figure out some of the things that are a little awkward to begin with. Yeah, we love the fairy tales also. That's, that's a huge influence. I, and you grew up with that one as well. Yeah, you know, I, this would be a good place to mention that. There's a couple other uh, 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 famous Imagineers here who have worked on uh, creating the Tiki Room for us. <laughs> I know, Tony's like, no. <laughs> um, it, this is some lesser known stars, yes, uh, who need to have a little more credit. But uh, I don't know if you know that uh, some of the bird cages in the Enchanted Tiki Room were designed by Bob Gurr. Everybody knows of him as designing things on wheels. And he told me it was very, very advanced engineering bending tubing. <laughs> and if you have uh, been out on the uh, patio there, uh, waiting to go into the show, and Tangaroa is telling you to stand back, and then all the little tiki babies come out of those flowers, those little flower blossoms, those were sculpted by our own Tony Baxter. And I understand that was your first project ever for 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 Wed. Is that correct? That was
was your first big project for Red. <laughs> and they're still there today. That's really, really cool. Uh, I, I, I love that um, I love that this has been put together. This, this whole show has just been, it's been, it's been amazing. Um, is there um, another story that you have about about the, the tiki's? I I know uh, Uti is one of my favorites, and uh, she, if you remember, she was the goddess uh, who was up in the canoe over the entrance into uh, the patio. Yeah. She's no longer there, but what was her story? Well, what you say about the canoe? Uh, they were dead decorating for the canaries here. And of course, I was available because I was going to work for the resort. And uh, Hank Baines was the head of bravery and props and dressings at the time. And the truck pulls up and there's, a, there's this uh, canoe hanging in there, and, and Hank came to me and said, well, he said, well, the canoe looks kind of blah. He said, would you mind putting some patterns on it? I said, oh, no, God, no. So I started chalking out while it was hanging in the truck these, these patterns, and the next thing I know, now they're trying to do it, to jack it up, to hang it up, so I'm working on an angle to do that, and then finally they take it out of the truck, and they take it over, and they start to put it on the building, and I'm following it wherever it goes, and <laughs> Really interesting. By the time they finally finished the last nut to hold it up, it was finished, and it, it was all painted. But you know, that's the way we did things in those days. You just did it. And, it was, it was a lot of fun. and you sculpted the fountain too, or parts of the fountain up on a, a, a cherry bed or something. Is that right? So uh, that is, you'll pre-order the book and yeah. all of that. You'll, you'll have something for you to hand out tonight. Okay, very good. Well, that's good. I know we're all looking forward to it. I am especially excited about reading this, and I can't wait. And thank you to everyone who put this together and for inviting us. This is a, it's an absolute treat. It's amazing to be up here. It's very, uh, it's a little nerve-wracking. <laughs> I'm a little nervous. I should have started out with Aloha. <laughs> this is great. Yeah, Aloha means goodbye. Thank you so much, everyone.